Hello, everyone. Welcome to another edition of Coffee Break. It's Steve Barrett here, the Editorial Director of PR Week, and I'm delighted to be joined by Nora Wolf, who's the founder of Wolf PR and also a new business that she launched during the pandemic called Wolfcraft, but uh, Brooklyn-based and looking forward to finding out more about your agency. So welcome to Coffee Break, Nora. Thanks so much for having me, Steve. Um, so tell us a bit about Wolf PR. You had a you have a nice surname which uh, has lended itself nicely to a cool PR agency name as well. What's what's the uh, what's the sell if you like for Wolf PR? Yeah, we gotta thank my dad for that last name. He did good there. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, so I've been running Wolf PR since 2011, so a little over 10 years now. Um, and we started out focusing on furniture, design, textile, interiors, and architecture. Um, and from there, it's really expanded to kind of deal with anything that encompasses design. So we've worked with a Fortune 100 material uh, manufacturing company, and we've worked with like a direct-to-consumer tiny cat food startup and everything in between. So yeah, after doing this for over a decade, I feel like I've touched kind of every kind of company, publicly traded, small independent. Um, and I like that we're a small company, so we really get to work with them on projects that maybe a bigger company wouldn't necessarily be able to manage. Um, we're pretty quick and nimble, and we get a lot of great results from that. Yeah, that's one of your philosophies, isn't it? That you don't necessarily want to grow into a giant behemoth, that you think you can provide better client service at a certain size. So talk us through that philosophy and tell us about the size of the firm and the amount of people, et cetera. Yeah, currently we are two with a handful of consultants providing support as well. Um, I think that there, I've worked within agencies and I've had my own firm, like I said, for a decade. But I've never worked at a big firm, but I hear from our clients who have worked with big firms that there's a lot of kind of red tape. There's a lot of placating. They'll meet with um, their account manager and then never talk to that person again. And then they'll be foisted off to a junior person. Um, so we kind of cut through a lot of that. Our clients really work with everyone on my team pretty regularly, weekly, if not daily. And we have really good relationships with editors. So there's not a lot of the message getting lost with um, our clients telling us something and then us bringing that message to the media. Um, and then the other thing that I think is really important that we do is we really won't say yes to our clients, even if they think they have a really good idea. At this point, our relationships with the media are crucial. So if our client's doing something that we think is really great, but they just need to like tweak it a little bit, we'll work with them to tweak it before we bring that news item to the media and if it's not newsy if it's not interesting we won't do it and i'm i'm not sure that um junior people know how to necessarily push back like that or when you have a bigger machine it's hard to kind of stop the wheels from turning so our clients really benefit from us only bringing amazing stuff to the media and then we really we compare we have benchmarks against their competitors and their peers and we generally get more placements for our clients than than their peers so we're really proud of that work yeah so when a client deals with you they know they're going to deal with you and they're not going to be sort of fobbed off with junior people or folks that you know that, that didn't sell them in the vision for the business that's right and you know like on the financial side right we're not paying for a huge office we're not paying for you know an office manager so our clients also benefit from a reduced fee i benefit because more of it goes in my pocket i think everyone's kind of winning there so that's why I like a small company. I think it everyone kind of does better. Yeah, and I think there's many excellent operators like yourself around the country, around the world, doing great PR. So it's good to hear the good to hear that end of the industry. We're often told that we only cover the big global behemoths at PR Week, and I always say, well, that's not actually true. And it's good to hear from all all areas because I think there are many many PR pros like yourself working and doing great work and. Um, you know, succeeding for clients. So uh, it's a good story to, to you know, give a bit more awareness to. Thanks, Steve. I appreciate that. Um, now, in lockdown, I mean, you were already kind of virtual and sort of ahead of the game in terms of what we've experienced over the last 18 months. Um, but you, you did launch a new offering during uh, the pandemic, Wolfcraft PR, Wolfcraft, which I guess is a little bit beyond uh, media relations and more into strategy. So tell us a bit about that. Yeah, that's right. Um, so yes, I did launch Wolfcraft. I was 
um, lockdown in Lisbon, Portugal by accident and started a brand new company with um, one of my closest friends from undergrad. So this is really focused on the strategy. I've noticed and I imagine any PR professional that you've spoken to, they have the issue of a client coming to them saying, I want PR on this thing. I don't know what the thing is. I don't have good assets. My story is kind of catastrophically disorganized. And then they're like, but do this for me. And you're kind of stuck in this place where it's like, we need to go back a few months and get all your stuff together. Um, your story isn't being told right. And I can't really in good faith bring this to the media. Or if you don't know how to say no to your clients, you bring it to the media and kind of start to sour your relationships there. So I notice that all the time with small companies all the way up to, again, these really big companies. Um, startups tend to be in this space a lot where they think they have a really good idea. And generally what they're building is interesting, but the way that they're talking about it doesn't make sense. There's not a story there yet. So we're really doing a lot of work to help our clients, what we call make a content ecosystem. So everything that's public facing supports their story, support, supports their value props, but is also interesting to the media and interesting to their client. If they're not able to differentiate themselves in a meaningful way to their end user, they're also not going to be able to differentiate themselves to the media. So we really look at everything public facing. I think there's a lot of services for backend, for SEO, for advertising. And once you get everyone to your website or to your app, humans still look at it. And the media is filled with humans. So we want to make sure that that content really supports what they're doing. So that's kind of the initial reason we started Wolfcraft. And is that particularly aimed at companies that might be early stage or startups and are now thinking, right, we need some PR or we need to do some marketing and promotion? Is that a sweet spot for that sort of offer? Um, no, we are working with quite a few startups, but we're also working, we worked with um, companies who are changing kind of their point of view, like they thought they were selling one thing and now they want to sell a lot more things kind of within the same space. So how do they pivot? We're working with a company who hasn't updated any of their materials in like five years and they're relying solely on getting new clients through relationships. And it's working for them, but they're leaving a lot on the table. So we're kind of going in and evaluating all their past work and seeing, you know, what their sales team needs, what their marketing team needs, what their website updates look like, what kind of content they should be pushing out to LinkedIn every month, what they should be pushing out through their social media channels and making sure that when they're buying photography, they're not spending $5,000 for images they can't use. Um, when they're working with their clients, they're not telling them one set of, value props and then their sales team comes in and tells them another set and then their account manager comes in and tells them another set. And so it kind of making sure everyone's aligned internally so that when they're speaking to the public, they kind of have a better idea of what, what like it's, there's a cohesive idea like there. Herding cats sounds like a, <laughs> a good analogy, but you're absolutely right. It's amazing in organizations how many different lines of, of activity are going on and the people aren't mm -hmm. necessarily talking to each other, especially these days, I guess, because oh. you don't bump into people, do you, and et cetera. So, yeah, um, interesting stuff. And are, are there any particular um, activations or of that that you, I mean, you don't have to name the client, but where you, where you got a result or where something happened that, that really prove the value of that uh, offering? Gosh, that's a great question. Um, I'm not sure if I can share too much because um, we do sign NDAs. Um, hmm, put me on the spot a little bit, Steve. <laughs> yeah, well, that's what I tend to do. <laughs> well, I love it. Yeah, keep, keep me on my toes. Um, <laughs> we had a client basically totally redesign their website after working with us um, because their messaging was really about 10 years dated, even though their website wasn't 10 years old. We've spoken with them quite a bit since then. And I think the results that they've gotten from their new messaging and their new content strategy. So when they bring on new content, we're not overseeing that, but we've given them an SOP and they're very happy with how streamlined that is now. Um, and I think they're getting better results, not just from clients, but they've been able to land some media on their own, um, which is what they wanted. That's why they reached out to us in the first place was to make sure that they could do this without an agency. They were tired of the relationship they had with the agency they were working with. And so we gave them a whole set of tools so that they could do that on their own. Not everyone wants that. We have clients who are taking us on for this onboarding road mapping moment, and then we will do their PR. But some folks really are tired of that kind of agency grind. So yeah. they're really happy. We've had people come back to us to do other 
projects for them. So we know that as a success. Um, but again, like I wish I could say a little bit more about that, but I really can't. Conundrum, we have a PR week. That's, uh, <laughs> I, I naively assumed when I came to work on the brand that everyone would want to tell us all about their work, but it's it's, actually, it's precisely the opposite because yeah. of the, what you said, but that that's fine. We can, uh, I get the drift and uh, tell us, you, you mentioned the media and how it's changed, changing all the time owned media, earned media, you've got different influences in different spaces, especially in specialist industries like the ones you cover. How do you keep on top of all that? And how do you keep those relationships up and, and continue to, to advise uh, your clients to get, you know, um, traction in lots of different spaces rather than just, of course, a, a piece in the New York Times is always very nice. But, um, but there's lots of other ways to get to the market now, aren't there? Who, yes, who doesn't want a piece in the New York Times, man? Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> um, so that's a great question. There's so much changing. One of the things that we do for our clients, um, whether they're with Wolf PR or Wolfcraft, is we do what's called a peer audit. We're trying to maybe workshop that name because it doesn't really express how valuable that tool is. But if you look at the next five, six, seven peers, competitors, people or brands that are doing the work that you want your business to be at in the next three to five years and see what they're doing and how they're responding and if they're successful. Um, and a lot of my clients, we say like, don't look at their aesthetics, don't look at their messaging, look at like the market share that they're getting, look at the stories that people are writing about them. You could kind of hate the business, but really learn a lot from how they're engaging with the media. So for us, we do an audit, um, kind of like a benchmarking audit for all our clients to see what's been changing and how their aspirational peers and competitors are responding to that. So that's one way that we really do get a lot of information um, and we're able to pivot. The other thing, I mean, this is like a boring PR answer, but we talk to our media contacts and say, you know, what's going on with your publication? You're only quarterly now, you're only digital now, like everything has to be with an affiliate link or whatever it is. So we kind of get those updates from our contacts themselves. Before the pandemic, none of our clients, like most of our clients sell things to an end user, either a trade architect and design community or like people like me and you who buy chairs for their homes, for example. Mm -hmm. Almost every single client before the pandemic did not have affiliate link um, programs, and now every single one has one. And that seems to be a really big revenue stream for the media. And whether there's not kind of like weird ethics involved is another conversation that we could have for like a couple hours, but that is a really big change that we're like kind of having to advise our clients on the fly and I've become an overnight expert on. And so, yeah, there's a lot that's happening, but I think benchmarking, we're really interested in research. Wolfcraft is founded on like a design thinking research methodology. So we use a lot of that um, to answer questions that we didn't know we had to be answering a year ago. Yeah, and presumably places like Instagram and uh, Pinterest and maybe some new sub stacks with specialists where journalists have split off and just doing their own thing. Are, the, are these things, are these trends happening in the design world as well? Yeah, less so with the sub stacks for design, but with technology, with the startups, there's a lot of space for that. Design is a little bit of a slow moving monster. Um, so the, it's the kind of ironic, isn't it, in a way? <laughs> Yeah, there's, I mean, like with anything that has a luxury arm to it, there's always kind of like an old school weight that you have to kind of pull over the finish line. Um, but the brands that do better or do a lot better during the pandemic were the ones that were already ready for digital. The ones that scoffed at it or weren't ready to make that investment, I think, suffered during the pandemic especially because design did so well, like furnishings did really well during the pandemic. Everyone was renovating their homes or fixing their interiors. Just but the what, supply chain element, isn't it? That's holding things up, I guess, now. That's right. Man, that's a huge thing for sure. Again, that's like something that like our clients benefit from talking with us about how to communicate that. And there's not a shortage of stories about how to deal with the supply chain. So we get our clients quoted for that stuff all the time. And again, that's not necessarily editors that I was pitching before the pandemic, but now I have relationships with those people. So there's that like nimbleness, that research part that like really our clients benefit from quite a bit. Just to finish up as a female yeah. founder and uh, you know, as an operator of a small business, what would your advice be to someone thinking about doing it? You know, because it's quite frightening, I guess, to leave the comfort of a big agency fold. 
Yeah, I don't know. I guess it was frightening for me to work at an agency. Um, <laughs> I think like, yeah, if if you want to do it, do it. Um, being a woman founder, I'm very proud of it. I think it's so cool to go out there and make my own rules for the company. Steve, I was telling you a little bit before we got on the call, even though we were working in an office, it wasn't five days a week. It was something that I really believed, you know, before this kind of workplace revolution conversation started, that my employees are people to retain them, but also to honor that they have a life outside of work. We were already working two and three days out of the office. So I think like that's something that I'm really proud of. We do profit sharing at my company. Like anything that you want to do, not necessarily as a female founder, but as your own business owner, you get to do it. And that is the coolest thing. You don't have to go by all these old fashioned HR rules if you don't want to. And so yeah. as I continue to build my company, that's something I'm very proud of. Well, we wish you continued good fortune, Nora. It's great to find out more about Wolf PR and uh, yeah, good luck for the future. Thank you so much for having me, Steve. It's a pleasure.